this is his uh, second stint, and um, he has a reputation for being uh, both uh, outspoken and knowledgeable, and uh, we're delighted to have him. As you know, uh, well, I'm sure you could read his bio on the uh, web, and I'm not going to go into all those details other than to say he's highly qualified to have had a lot of experience also on the legislative side of the House, and uh, he's here at a very uh, tiny moment. So without further ado, I may please introduce Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. I'm actually incredibly honored to be here this afternoon. Thank you, Tom, for such a wonderful introduction and inviting me. Um, from the outset, I must admit it's a bit overwhelming to be among some faculty and students and, and professionals in the field have such great mastery of the doctrines and statutes and legal precedent and current nuances related to national security and law and policy. Anyone who's been immersed in national security matters knows the terms of metamorphosis and fraught with varied and even contrasting viewpoints. One man's vacation picture in an airport or a train station might be another's national security crisis. Fortunately, I'm not here to discuss the scope of the intricacies of the larger subject. After all, my expertise, to the extent that it exists, is centered on national security within the much narrower context of communications policy. My intention today is to outline the most recent actions of the Federal Communications Commission pertaining to the protection of U.S. national security, identify the difficult position we are, we find ourselves with regard to the Chinese telecommunication providers and manufacturers, and raise certain concerns with respect the operations of the International Telecommunications Union, or the ITU, is more commonly known. Hopefully, I won't disappoint, and I'll still have at least some time at the end for any questions that you may have. To help frame the discussion, it seems appropriate to touch on why we expend so much energy protecting national security. Of course, we do so for the prevent immediate threats and attacks on our homeland, and our efforts can certainly reinforce unity and civic pride. Yet preservation of national security involves so much more. I see it as a mechanism and tool to ensure that America's preeminent value, individual freedom, is not jeopardized or surrendered at the hands of some other nation, state, or world group. Founding father, John Adams, wrote to his beloved wife, Posterity, you will never know how much it costs my generation to preserve your freedom. I hope you make good use of it. That ominous reminder reaffirm, reaffirms the underlying reasons for investing so much time, money, effort, and precious American life to protect our national security. America serves as a unique experiment in the history of the world, and freedom is the epicenter of that creative effort. Within the universe of our existing authority, the Commission has been taking necessary and appropriate steps to protect and preserve our national security. While the Commission's jurisdiction in the national security area is not extensive, we have certain oversight abilities when it comes to those entities and services we regulate. Specifically, the Commission has rules governing the review of media and telecommunications license applications and uh, to, to a certain extent uh, of the Foreign Ownership and the Communications Act prohibits foreign governments from holding an FCC license altogether. When a company, the reportable level of foreign ownership fi files an application, the Commission also refers it to executive branch agencies, commonly referred to as Team Telecom. This group provides advice to the Commission on national security, law enforcement, and trade and foreign policy concerns that are outside the Commission's traditional expertise. With the advice of Team Telecom, the Commission has reviewed numerous applications involving foreign ownership. Those applications have either been approved under face or pursuant to Team Telecom-led mitigation agreements. While well, the system has generally worked efficiency over the last two decades, Team Telecom's process could certainly be some improvements, including more formalized and streamlined structure and a firmer timeline for making some decisions. Just last week, and for the first time ever, the Commission denied an application over national security concerns. Specifically, China Mobile International requested in 2000 or 2011, yes, eight years ago, to provide international Section 214 services. For those of you who are not masters of commission speak, that means the requisite approval companies must obtain from the FCC to transport communications between the U.S. and foreign destinations. I think it's safe to say from the outset that the China mobile application 
raised red flags with both the FCC and Team Telecom. By way of background, China Mobile USA, a Delaware corporation, is wholly owned by China Mobile Limited, a Hong Kong company, which in turn is owned and controlled by the Chinese government. The commission ultimately found that China Mobile is vulnerable to exploitation, influence, and control by the Chinese government, and granting the license would jeopardize our national security and individual freedoms. In other words, providing China Mobile with greater access to U.S. telecommunications networks would have the potential, given the potential to give China with a track record of computer intrusion, economic espionage, and other ongoing intelligence activities, access to information carried over our networks, and the means to disrupt our communications. In addition, Chairman Pai recently announced that the Commission is reviewing similar International 214 authorization approved over a decade ago for other Chinese companies, including China Telecom and China Unicom. While China Mobile past posed only a potential threat, these other companies have already had extensive access to our networks, and we need to know what extent that may have led to harm, if any, caused by this exposure. The FCC's concerns with respect to China extend well beyond the licensing context. China, unlike most other countries, is attempting to monopolize the development and deployment of 5G technologies and appears interested in using 5G network access for a variety of nefarious purposes. It is important to note at the outset that the communist Chinese government and its companies are virtually one and the same. Not only is, not, not only is company leadership coterminous, coterminous with Communist Party membership, but there's no refusing any government advice about operations or requests to assist the Chinese government in surveillance of tenants. The government can also subsidize its providers, including low-cost loans, unlimited operating capital, and thus allow wireless providers to offer competitive service below cost. This permits wireless providers to gain market, market share not only within China, but internationally. Many of these advantages also occur to Chinese manufacturers by providing below-cost equipment, throwing cheap labor at service projects, and engaging in intellectual property theft, China manufacturers have also been able to win contracts throughout the world. The ability to gain market share internationally is exacerbated by the export of Chinese equipment that is not compatible with other equipment brands, meaning that once a wireless provider or country invests in this equipment, they are beholden to the Chinese manufacturer. This practice is more common than you may think. Additionally, China attempts Chinese attempts to use international multi-stakeholder organizations to favor their manufactured technologies over others continues to be extremely problematic. Standard setting bodies establish the basic protocols and procedures to govern how networks operate, including technical specifications and inter interoperability guidelines. Yet we know that China officials have tried to influence leadership positions within such bodies and block Western companies' technologies. This just amounts to another unacceptable mechanism to facilitate their global position on 5G. Combined, these practices are resulting in a pervasive presence of Chinese equipment and providers in several nations' communication infrastructure, placing their, placing their national security at risk as Chinese equipment and providers become ingrained in more nation, nations' communications markets. The issues raised in the China Mobile Order become evident. The Chinese government has the potential to access information that touches the equipment or is carried on that network. In our modern society, data and internet networks are the core infrastructure for determining economic deployment and military money, and therefore constitute the battlefields we will define our future. We have an obligation to address this situation strategically and aggressively. Make no mistake, the U.S. will need to take every necessary precaution to prevent the current state of affairs from turning into an even more heightened full-fledged international conflict. The topics just are so slight. A few of you may be unfamiliar with the ITU, a largely unknown component of the United Nations whose primary mission is to harmonize global radio spectrum. Specifically, the ITU is the international body that convenes the World Radio Communications Conference, where 190 or so countries meet every four years to negotiate and form consensus on how best divvy up wireless frequency for various uses, both new and old applications. In the intervening period between conferences, the ITU prepares and operates as one of the standard setting bodies and certain wireless functionalities, 
knowing this, you may believe that its significance far exceeds its notoriety. To give some context, global spectrum harmonization is the offering of commercial services on the same or nearby frequencies around the world. Doing so allows consumers to use the same devices at home and abroad and creates economics, economies of scale by enabling research, development, and manufacturing costs to be widely dispersed, promoting investment <coughs> and innovation while reducing the cost of devices and services for Americans. Thus, the, the more markets around the globe that use the same spectrum frequencies or the same commercial services, the cheaper and easier it is to get products through the entire ecosystem. Given the recognized benefits of harmonization, what exactly is the problem with the ITU? The answer is multifold. First and foremost, it shouldn't be surprising that a multi-layered, multilateral subsidy, a subsidiary of the UN, doesn't want to stay focused on its core mission. There is exceeding desire by many member states, the ITU, to venture beyond its mandate and regulate the exciting new technology developments of the day, such as the inner works of the internet, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, drones, and the like. In other words, the ITU wants to be the global regulator for shiny new things. While these matters are important, they generally aren't within the jurisdiction of the international authorities who attend ITU gatherings, but are regulated by national, not international, regulators and agencies. Second, the ITU has a problem whereby member countries try to ensure that their people's staff are, that are staffed at the agency, even if it is to detriment of the organization. These individuals operate with barely any oversight or control by the elected ITU leadership, giving them free reign to pick and choose projects to pursue, hire favored and even biased technological uh, consultants, set up questionable fora within which they can tilt, substance and skew procedures to gain the desired outcome, and so much more. In some regards, staff agendas, not member states, are driving ITU functions. Third, elected leadership positions at the ITU tend to go to the next person in line, instead of the most qualified person or someone with a fresh vision who is willing to reform its operations, and more importantly, follow its actual mission. As you can imagine, this tends to prolong stale thinking and allow management flaws to persist, the lack of a merit-based system for advancement, and instead a reliance on longevity and entrenchment creates an environment inclined towards status quo and rent seeking by well-connected interests rather than cutting edge innovation and forward progress. But what does all this have to do with our national security? Let me explain. These structural and operational problems perpetuate a larger, more fundamental failure. The outcomes to debates surrounding recent spectrum policy decisions have come at the expense of US interests and positions. In other words, organizational audit is frequently ruled against our views and requests, and that has an impact on our national security on multiple fronts. Those implications range from the rather benign, perceived standing in the international community, to the serious, the health of our wireless providers, adoption of, of anti-US industry and industrial policy, and the long-term economic well-being of our nation. The willingness of some countries to surrender their sovereignty to the whims of the so-called global community, or more specifically to the ideologies opposed to our own, places the United States at risk, as well as those of other like-minded countries. Should the WRC, as better known in November, produce further the unacceptable outcomes for the US, our need will be to reevaluate our relationship with this body and become even more troublesome changes are in the foot. As the largest contributor to the ITU financing, the U.S. should expect more balanced, a more balanced balance sheet when it comes to the agency spectrum decisions. Separately, it must be stated that the current Secretary General is a Chinese national and that obtaining the ITU head position was an important achievement for China. It has not gone unnoticed that this leadership position has been used both subtly and overtly as part of China's larger global play. Consider that the ITU signed a 2017 Memorandum of Understanding to expand worldwide technology infrastructure and internet connectivity through China's own Belt and Road Initiative. We cannot ignore the relationship between some current ITU policies and the grander goals to enhance mainland China. And more importantly, we cannot dismiss the impact of such activities on the current and future national security of the United States. One last topic. 
I want to quickly discuss the recent executive order that came to protecting communications and technology supply chain signed by President Trump yesterday afternoon. Under the text, the President directed the Secretary of Commerce in consultation with heads of other executive agencies to prohibit any transaction or use of communication technology or services supplied by entities owned, controlled, or subject to the jurisdiction of foreign adversaries. To be clear, this order does not designate any specific country or companies that risks, as risks, instead opting to place <coughs> such decisions in the hands of the executive agencies to determine whether a transaction can raise national security issues. If there are national security implications, the executive agencies have the ability to negotiate mitigation measures, if possible, if necessary, or prohibit the technology or services altogether. I appreciate the President's recognition of the importance of this national communications infrastructure that we are part of, and this strong effort to protect against U.S. adversaries who may be creating and exploiting vulnerabilities to engage in malicious cyber-enabled actions, including economic and industrial espionage against the United States and its people. This aggressive and decisive action will serve as a forceful tool to help minimize this national security threat. So I'll stop there so I can turn to the inquisition, I mean the discussion portion of today's event. Trust me, I hope I to learn as much from you as you may have learned from me in these few minutes. I appreciate your attendance, your, your, uh, your quietness in this moment. Now I'd like to open up the floor to whatever questions you may have on this fine day. What's on your mind? We'll start here. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Thank you very much for your comments. All right, Paul Reeves from Secretary of America, Secretary of Energy. I want to ask you about the Commission's efforts to open up more mid and sector sure. for fifth generation wireless networks. Um, as you know, China has allocated four, over 400 billion to expanding 5G infrastructure. Um, U.S. companies are struggling to catch up to that. Uh, what is the FCC doing to ensure that we have more uh, 5G across a wider band of spectrum, not just telecom? So I've been. This is uh, in my sweet spot. I've spent the last three and a half years working on mid-band spectrum. You're starting to see the, the uh, results of that work. We're going to have CBRS 3.5 to 3.7 spectrum available in the very near future. 3.55 spectrum available in the very near future for. Uh, license purposes. We've worked through the last components. I hope that will to make that operational. I hope that will happen in the next give or take a month and a half or so. Um, and, and then we're going to move to an auction process to open up the license portion of that. It'll probably be second quarter of next year. That's going to provide 70 megahertz of license spectrum. Uh, an entity can open up, can, can own or, or hold 40 megahertz of that. Uh, but that's not the end of it because 40 megahertz isn't going to build a 5G network. We're also working extensively, and I've spent a great deal of time on what's known as the C band, 3.7 to 4.2, the 500 megahertz. It's unlikely we're going to have all 500 megahertz reallocated, but it's really uh, likely that we're going to be in the 200 to 300 range, and probably leaning more towards 300 megahertz of, of mid band spectrum. Additionally, what another megahertz, another 100 megahertz is, is um, being examined as we speak in the 3.45 to 3.55. It's something that DOD holds today, and something I thought we were already heading towards clearing in the, in the last couple of years. Uh, we got a little bit of sidetracked. Uh, we're now doing this feasibility study. I'm hoping that we conclude it soon. We can move to reallocation for commercial purposes. But I've also made clear that we need to um, free as much as possible 3.1 to 3.45 gigahertz band. So what we're talking about is putting as much mid band as we possibly can. This is the sweet spot, which is happening globally. It's not. That's why I talked about spectrum harmonization. My speech and why it's so important for the United States. Um, those are the bands that are also being looked at internationally uh, for mid band plays. It doesn't mean that the low band or the high band is not important. We need a way that's going to continue to be something that's going to grow as time, as time progresses. We've seen great uh, success in a number of mid band spectrum, uh, or high band uh, mid millimeter wave testing and, and, and offering of services, and will expand as this year goes on. So I'm excited on where we are as a nation. I recognize we have challenges against it, that other countries are seeking to be first uh, in the world in terms of 5G. I think we're well positioned to lead that effort as we did at 4G, and we'll be uh, 
prime to as, as we as we succeed there to, to uh, take benefit of all of the applications that come from that and the case studies and the leadership and the innovation that will happen in the ecosystem with that. Does that help? Yes, we have a microphone. Uh, yes, Andrew Burroughs at Bachner Group. Uh, could you expand a little bit on the U.S.'s initiatives with ITU currently, and uh, I guess what are the priorities being uh, discussed within that environment based on the current situation with the uh, with China's uh, seat in the leadership? Well, look, we uh, I've been aggressive in talking about this issue. I participated in WRC 15. And, and raised a number of these issues as my experience happened at the time. I've been talking about this for quite a while, both domestically and international in my, my travels. I think the, the message that, that I've carried forward is that reforms need to happen. I think some reforms happened in 2015, but the larger ones have kind of uh, been to the sidelines, and there's reasons for that, and some of them include how the leadership is structured. Part of my reason for raising these uh, procedural issues is to hopefully get new blood into the system. We saw that this year. We had the election of the first U.S. woman to a leadership position in the history of the ITU. That's a wonderful outcome. We haven't had a position in the ITU for a long while in the United States. So having just being in, being in the leadership is, I think, has a valuable role. We have to make that decision. I, I make the argument. We either have to be in or we have to be out. And if we're going to be out, then let's step out and let's find, you know, let's pair with those number of countries that are leaders in wireless technology and do what we think we should, we should do best rather than curtailing to, an, to, an, to a body that's made up of many countries that, that necessarily wireless is not uh, their primary primary concern or will not be in, in, in the foreseeable future. So I think we've had some success so far in terms of uh, carrying the message of reform. I think a great deal needs to happen going forward. I'm really both um, interested and worried and uh, maybe some other adjectives about how WRC 19 will go in November. Um, that is that is shaping up to be a, quite a monumental um, uh, challenge given the 5G issues that will be put before it. Additional bands will be contested, um, and also the makeup and, and the relationships of the, of the world and, it, and whether other geopolitical issues bleed into, uh, as they have in the past, bleed into how the ITU operates. And I think that's where I was also getting to that fact that I'm worried that some of those other concerns about whether the US influence in life and, and wireless issues in the past, um, how those uh, were making decisions. And we saw this in 2015 with what Europe was willing to do um, on a number of bands that we were seeking uh, to promote. They were intentionally blocking, in my opinion, most of that, I'd say my opinion, I think it was my the direct conversations I had with representatives of a number of nations of the EU, uh, they were intentionally blocking the U.S. Uh, to help uh, slow down the progress uh, of the United States wireless companies, um, and also hopefully prop up their companies, which were you know, mired in debt um, and, and somewhat behind in terms of technology. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, with the Chinese clamping down. Uh, I notice now in Hong Kong, what can the average Chinese person or people do to counter this, and especially in telecommunications? Well, it's been um, a disturbing part of my career, I must admit. Uh, I spent a great deal of time on trade policy in the last 25 years, and I think there was a, a belief that changing our trade relationships with China and the rest of the world would open up the marketplace and open up the world for, or open up China for a for free flow of information. Uh, I think that is, uh, that was maybe an overstatement, and maybe uh, expectations were too grandeur at the time. I think what we've seen is, is that a totalitarian state, in some regards, that wants to protect um, its informa information from getting to its citizens has been successful. It used the market access as a means to prevent um, to, to force companies to build products, basically, to prevent its own citizens from uh, from information that may benefit uh, the nation as a, as a whole. So the, the, the heart of your question is what can the Chinese, um, the average Chinese person, you know, do these days? 
um, to, to address the, the, the structure that, that the Chinese government has put forward. And, and I don't have a good answer for you. I honestly, um, you know, I look upon it and, and, and I, um, how do I say this? I mean, you know, it's one of those I, I've added to my prayer list because uh, you know, I don't know what you know, to think about what you, you know, sacrificed for you. It's not this generation, you're thinking three or four generations down the road, and you're just a cog um, as, as an individual in, in, that, uh, in that structure. I think it's incredibly um, antithetical to how the United States operates and how the, the United States was founded. So um, I, I think we're, we, we look upon that and don't have good tools right now to respond to some of the things that you know, technology-wise. And then we haven't figured out the larger picture that, that I leave in other people's hands who are much more experienced in uh, dealing with the immediate, when we trade, or uh, military issues that are being raised on multiple fronts. So um, I wish I had a, a, I'd say a rosier picture. I wish I had uh, some optimism. I, I, at the current moment, I don't. Um, and I, I like to believe that will, that will change. I, 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 I feel like it's one of those areas where you look back in your career and, 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 and you thought it was going to go one way and it completely went the other way. Well, if you thought that Hong Kong was going to be this wonderful, um, you know, vision of what China could become, and it is not. Um, and, and, and from, from my perspective, it, they, their perspective is coming, but it turned out to have exactly how they would have liked it to be, uh, I believe. So I think that's problematic, and, and, and no company can operate in China. The government is with it without the Chinese the government partnership in one form or another. And the biggest companies, um, the members from the CEO down are, are China, you know, Communist Party members, um, and they're taking take advice, advice is, you know, put in quotes, uh, from, the, from the government itself. So uh, it, it's just a structure that uh, is so troubling to the future of, of, of I think, you know, uh, I, I personally believe it's a threat, a threat to our global democracy and how we how we respond to that, and, and that's in other people's hands. We have my, my tiny role of the FCC. Um, we only deal with as applications or things that go before us, but Looking in a bigger picture based on my past experience, I'm just incredibly troubled by where we are. Another question here. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm Troy Barnes, a strategic policy fellow with the United States Air Force. I'm curious uh, with the potential for European nations to make decisions in the near future on 5G with China, what the implications are for our relationship with those European nations insofar as they have freer access to our networks and whether or not we can see any potential policies coming out. Um, as European nations, one after the other, may, may decide to build the 5G network with China around. Oh yes, we, we, we've seen the relationships between a number of European countries uh, and, and, and Chinese manufacturers and Chinese providers, uh, and the willingness to, to uh, for lack of a better word, push back on, on expression by the United States government of concerns on national security fronts of what technology may be able to do and potentially can do in, 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 in different settings, probably we can talk about the more specifics of the, what is being done. But um, I think the, the European governments, and I've talked to a number of myself, that um, while they recognize that there are, there are concerns, they, they, they believe they can contain some of those um, national security concerns, whether it be you know, trying to protect the core. I, I don't think in the 5G world, they're looking at it in a more realistic way based on how the technology is intended to operate. So I really worry that they're short sighted on this. Some of it has been, as what I talked about in my speech, is that a number of them have bought previous equipment or it's at such a discount and it's so ingrained in, in, in some of their networks that they can't, it's not something you can just rip out, it's not something, it's not interoperable with other things, so even if it's benign and of itself, you're, you're beholding to the future version or the future generation, incredibly problematic going forward. Um, so I do worry about where we are, um, you know, the, the, uh, I talked about the executive order and, and, and I wasn't in, in part of the framing of it, but I do appreciate how we got to where we are. We are standing in somewhat, um, you know, not alone, but we're, there are very few that have, have, a, have agreed with, with our position, and that's an ongoing negotiation conversation with the right people in the U.S. government, as, as I understand and follow closely. Um, but it, it does seem incredibly problematic that, that while they would acknowledge some concerns in both Europe and, and even in some countries in North America, uh, they, they aren't willing to, to take the step that we have, and I think that's, that, that's really uh, difficult and what does it mean going forward uh, for our relationships, and what does it mean for uh, the, the transfer of information globally, uh, given if, they, if their networks prove to be, uh, which we you know, fully acknowledge, that have capability of being 
um, accessed and intercepted and the information being used to for different purposes. Commissioner, thank you for being here. I'm John Petrushka, an MBA student at Georgetown University. And I've got a question about uh, Chinese investment and in non-core components in 5G networks. So there's obviously been a precedent that's been set by American carriers not to have Chinese components in the core of 5G technology, but do you foresee any or are there any existing uh, policy-oriented roadblocks to Chinese investment in data centers and in other infrastructure components of 5G? I think that's uh, many agencies that are involved in that, not necessarily just us. We may have just a smaller role given the, the authority provided by Congress to other agencies. But to your point, I don't, and I was kind of alluded to this, I don't know that you can separate the core from, from the edges or the edge uh, in the future 5G network because we're trying to push commuting power out to the edges. We're not, we're not trying to, but it is a, the diffusion of the, of the, the, uh, met, the computing um, in, in the next generation that is. The benefits, the, the, the brings benefits such as lower latency uh, and, and, and greater uh, cases cases of the, of the, of the benefiting from the speed and other things that go with that. So I worry that you, that you can't, you know, when people say, oh, we'll, we'll give them a thing, that's what you've seen some in some Europe and other places, is well, well, don't worry about the antennas, don't worry about the edge, don't worry about some of these other things because they can be contained. And I don't know that that exactly is true in my conversations with some major technology companies that both operate in the United States. That, that, that both the United States centered and international, they don't know that they necessarily agree with that. Um, and so I worry. Um, and so to your point, you know, is, is, is the funding and, the, and their operations going to be, you know, uh, can, can they get things like data centers? I think we have to be cognizant of all efforts uh, and, and mindful of all those things. And I, I look for that for the federal agencies that are part of Team Telecom provide advice to us and we have uh, an expertise to the extent we have authority to regulate any of the different fields. We don't oversee data centers today, uh, but it may be the providers themselves that have some of the services that flow from that that we do regulate. And so that that may be part of the part of the equation uh, as we well. forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, you all over I'm uh, actually faculty here at Danny Morgan. Uh, so part of me I'm not an expert in the telecoms field, so let me ask them basically a much more general okay. question. Um, you've depicted a very clear structural threat of China to let's say, U.S. technological dominance in the telecoms field. Uh, but can you explain to what extent uh, President Trump's uh, decision yesterday to use emergency powers is driven by um, the ongoing trade talks with China? Because at different points of the trade talks, um, the Huawei CFO was arrested in Canada, but also ZTE was brought back from the brink. And it seems that at these really critical points, um, something about Huawei seems to come in the news. So how can you balance with perhaps this uh, political or economic uh, story, as well as the technical structural story that you've been talking about. No, I think that's a very fair question, but I must admit, I can only look at it from the, uh, the, the data and the information that I have before. I'm not part of the larger trade conversation that's occurring on an ongoing basis. We made the application that's in terms of China Mobile, an application for us that's pending uh, in seven, seven years, it's a different story. Um, but I don't have, the, I'm not part of that the larger imagination. So when I look at the announcement from, from the president in terms of what is needed, I look at it as a factual matter in terms of the information that I have and have been presented as part of my role. I can't uh, and don't have the information to consider what are the macro um, geopolitical slash trade issues that may be involving um, that you mentioned, you know, the, the arrest of, 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 the, of the woman in China and the potential sending to, uh, to uh, the potential uh, of, of relocating her to, for, for potential charges elsewhere. Um, I, I, I think that that's something that's outside my value work and outside my expertise. And so I, I try to make decisions so I can look at what the uh, president announced. I can say, yeah, based on the facts and the record that we've done at the commission, I think it's consistent with that. I think it's helpful for that purpose. And we, use, we can use tools on that. If it's got other uh, and kind of other parts to that equation, uh, I'm not privy to them, and I, I, I think that I have to defer that to, to other uh, individuals for the administration. Thank you. Hi, Commissioner O'Reilly. <coughs> Excuse me, Kelsey Griffiths at Law 360. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know if this moots the national security proposal. <clears throat> so sorry, I seem to be losing my voice this very moment. Sorry, it's okay. <laughs> Can someone else say it? Okay. Sorry. She's going to take a quick uh, water break and uh, squash it out here. 
More questions? Um, hi, thank you very much for your talk. Um, in the executive order that was issued yesterday, um, is there an element of extraterritoriality that could apply to international companies, i.e. not the US? Uh, doing business with Huawei? Well, I think there's, there's two parts here, and, and, and look, I, I wasn't in the framing of the supply chain item. I'm still digesting the components itself. I know the previous versions, I'm trying to compare how they match up with them. But uh, the, there, are, there are two kind of things that are moving at the same time. One is a supply chain item, which you referenced, and that doesn't, is not a country or co company specific. You know, by, you know, agnostic to those issues. The second is the question of you know, the addition of Huawei to, uh, to the commerce list and what, you know, in terms of needing a license for obtaining um, U.S. Uh, manufacturing uh, equipment or you know, components. Um, I think so the two are, are separate. I, I, I wasn't party to them to know if they're, obviously the same, same people had influence on them, but I, I am not party to know the one leads to the other. Um, and, and, and so I think needs to, to be seen how the, the impact is in terms of your extraterritorial portion. I need to digest this a little bit closer since I wasn't in the framing part of it. I think it's a, it's a um, I, I, I think I, I trust that the, the professionals within the administration have fully explored all of the issues before we got to this point. It has been something that has been debated extensively. It's not a, um, a, a something, that, it is something that is of so importance it has been debated for quite a while. It's, you know, I, I've been aware of it that has potential for, for a significant number of months. And so it, um, the, I'm sure the, the, the administration has, has, has gone through a number of those, um, those machinations uh, and, and debates within their uh, the requisite uh, conversations. Hi, Commissioner O'Reilly. Kelsey Griff is at Law 3 I'm gonna try this again. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about whether the executive order and the Huawei, uh, for lack of a better word, blacklisting last night affects uh, or moots the FCC's national security proposal that's also pending. Um, if so, is there anything else you would do to help some of these small rural carriers afford products that aren't uh, put out by Huawei and DTE? So when you mentioned the, the item before the FCC, I assume you mean the, the limitations on USF funding uh, that we have a pending item on. And it's something that the, the, the chairman will decide the timing of the particulars. But uh, we're trying to figure that out exactly, and I was debating that with staff this morning trying to figure out what are the relationships and does the one make the other moot and, and we're trying to have that exact conversation and I, I don't know the answer as of yet. We'll certainly, um, I believe and I've said in the past, I do believe uh, whether, you know, that someone has to consider the cost of, of, of limitation of equipment, uh, it's certainly the pending equipment or equipment that's already incorporated or immediately pending, um, someone's going to need to figure out how to address that because they're small carrier they can't have neither the time nor the money to address that. And there's reasons why they adopted the equipment in the first place. Um, and so we'll have to, someone will have to consider how that is. That is up. It may be the decision is made, they're required to, to pay the cost. It may be the, 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 the <coughs> funding, it may be some other mechanism. There have been lots of different ideas that have floated in throughout town. Um, I'm not part of that decision making process right now, but I think someone will have to address that. Right now. More questions? Um, my name is Armando Chapelli. I'm a businessman, layman. Um, we are concerned, expressed concern here today about the misuse of technology for the repressive uh, purposes and uh, systems that are adverse to our value system. Can you tell me how I can be sprung out of Twitter jail, please? <laughs> so, uh, because we, it seems to me that we have internalized repression here in our country with Facebook and Twitter and other uh, mass media that willy-nilly and for their own, at their own discretion, censor speech. Sure. Well, two parts. One is the FCC doesn't regulate uh, social media. 
but I'm very cognizant of the debate. So the question, you know, in, in my past life, I'm very familiar with how, how the statutory provisions were drafted, specifically the item that people highlighted, Section 230 of what's now the Communications Decency Act, which is a larger piece of the Communications Act. So I'm familiar with the statutory provision. Uh, that provides uh, liability protections to, uh, to, to those companies that you mentioned and others as well, uh, so that they can be and can regulate uh, and can censor as they see fit um, going forward. Uh, people have tried to equate the, the structure uh, today as a, the, the, they would like to see as more of a common care situation that we have regulated the telecommunications in the past. You have to take all comers, take all comments, and, 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 and sit back and, 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 try, and traverse the, the communications. Uh, this was meant by Congress to be different, and that's why you, s you see the structure different. Um, it may be something that Congress, and they have been, and I'm, I'm watching conversations with, with old colleagues and friends, or having the conversations whether they want to change that equation and change the balances of Section 230 uh, to provide more of a common carrier-like structure. Uh, I can't, and I, like I said, I don't have regulatory power. I, I would not be concerned about that necessarily because I don't recognize how we got to where we are. The question becomes, that, you know, out of Twitter jail is, is you know, there, there's an argument presented yesterday, or no, there's been multiple, uh, multiple layers I, uh, by multiple people, so I don't want to you know, give anyone credence to it, but it's been this, that, they're, that, they, that some of the social media companies have turned into a utility, and I'm having a tough time understanding that from just a consumer perspective, separate since I said I don't regulate it, but I have a tough time considering uh, that I see that, that, that Twitter is a utility or that, he, that, that Facebook is a YouTube. I could see an argument potentially, I'm not agreeing with per se, but I could see an argument necessarily that maybe maybe a, a Google could some of the features and functions that they offer, or potentially maybe Amazon, they could see, so I could see the argument more clear um, based on my, 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 my past work than I do with some, you know, something of a social media structure where it's a utility and should be treated like a common carrier and therefore get to the point of how they, they, they you know, we, Intentionally, the Congress, and I was part of that equation at the time, intentionally wanted the entities to be able to censor. And they were encouraged to censor for purposes of, of pulling down um, information and, and, and visual, uh, visual representations that I think many uh, members of Congress at the time didn't want to see, but wanted to give them the power rather than, and we went, it was part of a larger fight that got challenged in, into the, the, in the courts. Um, and, and the efforts going forward. So I, I think it's something they intentionally wanted the carriers to be able to protect it and to censor. And now that they're exercising that censorship, um, and, and, they are, and, 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 and many people will make an argument, and I'm not party to this, because again, I'm saying only from a consumer perspective, not from a regulator perspective, but to make an argument that the, the censoring is biased, um, what is, the, the, what is the, the right response to that? And that's why I think you're seeing a, a healthy conversation on whether the, the, the statute should be changed or whether the procedures within should be expressed or explained more um, uh, or potentially adjusted uh, going forward. And, and again, I'm not party to that, so I don't know what's more than what would be the right tools to, to deal with that if it turns out to be, a, to be an accurate representation. Would you like to know why I'm in jail for? <laughs> if, it, if it's uh, okay for a public, uh, public it's totally, it's totally name. Uh, okay, then that would be okay. I, Jim Acosta's name is yeah. Abilio Jim Acosta. Abilio, uh, I'm Cuban American. Abilio is a Cuban name that only can be found in the mountains of that country. And since Jim Acosta has been critical of conservative population, whatever, rednecks, I observed that Jim Acosta may be a Cuban redneck. And you know, an ironic statement. I said, "Go figure." That's hate speech. That's not hate speech. It's a joke. It's meaningless. But I have not been able to participate since October. I haven't seen this. And I will not take it down because I will not be repressed in my country. So when you worry about whether the Chinese citizen has a way to combat the repression, you need to also worry about you know, doing something about what's going on here. Fair point, but I would say there's, there's a major difference in the sense that if you um, don't like Twitter, um, and just two years ago it was not worth that much, um, there are a number of 
wealthy people and smart people, we could create a, you know something different or similar to Twitter that, that could steal customers and subscribers and users of Twitter. Think about, you know, say, well, that's really hard, right? Because Twitter is so ingrained in our activity and, and, and day later. Well, we, we had that experience. If you look at what's happened, um, and I was one of the early, and still have, you know, many people were uh, huge adopters of AOL and then became huge adopters of Yahoo. And then Google came along and said, you know, we can do a better search project. We can do a better, you know, search algorithms. We can do a better outcome than they're doing. And they were able to, you know, 100% market share or 80% market share in certain instances, and now those companies can be bought for the pennies that they once were. So there is the ability. You do not have that same ability in China. You do you, if you, well, you don't. You know, there is no ability to build your own network if you don't believe what is happening. I think that's that's a substantial. Now, Twitter's recent uh, valuation has gone up, but just two years ago, it wouldn't have cost that much to either buy them or to 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 raise revenue or raise or funding to compete against them. Um, and that's the beauty, I think, of the United States. The, the reaction is not necessarily to um, try and you know restrict or regulate their particular behavior, as it is to introduce um, alternatives that can be more successful. Next question. Okay. That's fair. Yeah, that's completely fair to have doubts of the run. It's completely fair. Um, hi, Commissioner. One more question sure. about how this executive order and the volume blacklisting might um, affect the Commission's activities. Uh, do you happen to um, – I'm so sorry. I'm, like, terrible at asking questions today. I have lost my train of thought and write it down. So if so, I'll catch you afterward. Absolutely. Thanks. I'll be available. More questions? Uh, Mr. Commissioner, uh, yesterday uh, the uh, the Lena Chow, the Secretary of Transportation asked the FCC to delay uh, its rules on the 5.9 gigahertz spectrum. I wonder if you have a perspective on this. Um, when and how do you see the FCC coming down on whether or not it can be safely uh, regulated? Well, I wasn't part of that conversation. I think it's been reported. It seems my reporting, the reporting that I've seen seems accurate. Um, that they asked for a one delay. So I look forward to seeing the item hopefully in our July time frame as the chairman's wishes. Um, I don't know that, that, that you know, given where um, the chairman had talked about just a couple of days ago in terms of where the content may be, I'm kind of slightly surprised on um, the concerns may be because he talked about having a proceeding um, that was very broad from the status quo to dramatic changes and everywhere in between. So I find that to be a pretty thoughtful um, very, unique, for my own purposes, even my selfish views on the topic I've talked about and, and testified yesterday in front of Congress where I think that a portion of the spectrum uh, is going to need to be made available for a license to use the 75 megahertz portion. Uh, you know, for my own selfish use, if I found you know, that, a, that a broader proceeding isn't, isn't exactly in, necessarily my interest, but I understand what the chairman was doing, but I thought it was very thoughtful. And so I, I, I'm not sure I understand why exactly to, to, um, to delay that per se, but I look forward to having those conversations and seeing what it means um, as we get closer to July and meeting. Well, I'll ask a question, should it? Net neutrality. <laughs> well, uh, what's your question? <laughs> what could you tell us about that? How is it going? How do you see it developing? Well, um, I, I, I think I've talked about this issue for probably about 10 years now. Um, and the good part is it's kind of, we did an entire hearing yesterday, and I think it was mentioned maybe once. Um, that, that would not have been the same case two or three years ago. Um, I, I think there's becoming fatigue with the debate over net neutrality. Uh, and I think that you know, when I talk to most uh, rational players in the conversation, and the, the, whether they be agreement in my position or elsewise, um, there is common agreement on uh, substantive potential changes we could make um, that, that, and policy-wise, whether they be done at the FCC or by Congress, that could address some of the concerns that, that have, are articulated in the net neutrality debate. Not all of those concerns make the, the concerns that have been expressed um, and part of the, uh, the support for net neutrality make sense, in my opinion. I've talked about multiple times why I think the idea that all traffic has to travel you know, we treat equally as irrational. Um, it's never how the internet has functioned in the past. 
and it actually be harmful if the internet were to move in that direction going forward. So all, not all the debate um, is in agreement. I think there's a great need to have paid prioritization going forward. But, but there are components that we are of agreement um, and, and could be adopted um, and help settle some or at least a heavy portion of the conversation. I think that right now in this current environment that politics um, are probably larger than the substance and that one side or another feels more comfortable with debating the issue rather than resolving the issue. Um, and that's changed over time and, and circumstances and we're to see where it goes, but I don't feel at the current moment that and I defer to, to those that work uh, in, in the body, but I don't feel at the current moment that Congress is uh, intending to legislate on the, on the subject. Uh, and therefore, it, it becomes a question of what do our past rules uh, that we adopted in, in this commission and how are they challenging the court? Um, and how does that court uh, challenge, you know, where is the resolution from the D.C. Circuit and potentially to the Supreme Court? And what does that mean uh, for the past rules and what does it mean for activity going forward? So um, I'm a little frustrated with the debate. I'm glad that we don't talk about it as much. Um, it's, it's, been, it's been dumbed down, sadly. Um, on something that we probably could find a lot of common agreement if it was a, absent of uh, a lot of uh, media attention. But, uh, but, but being where that is, and that, that, that's understandable given the, the universe we operate, um, I just um, I find that we're probably not making any progress on it in the very near future. Well, um, I think we've reached the hour. would like to please join me in thanking Commissioner uh, O'Reilly. <laughs> Also available to collect any game badges you'd like to recycle when we that's possible.
and it's not exactly to my expertise or the FCC, but I had a background in this. I was terrific. It's been worthwhile for my career. We really are still very quick. Excellent. All right, how do we help the press? Well, I'll just have a question. Sorry, I have to talk to you for me.
Um, no, but we can set it up ahead of time if you want to start doing that. That's easy to do. Yeah. I could I could actually show you how to do that. Okay. I'd like to, yeah. Yeah, I know you've been you you want to help as much as possible. Exactly. Yeah. Military Yeah. You don't want a single point of failure. Uh, yep. Huh? Oh, really? It can, if you're not used to it, it is. It, I think that's what it was. And you know, it can be very stressful. It can be very. Um, Yeah. Different people. It demanded that all the staff show up, all the students. And, you know, well, you can do that with the staff, but. I think that was, you know, people are resentful because they're busy. Oh, yeah. And I just never agreed with that. Like the. So now it's voluntary. I'm very glad about that. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't seem like we have a. For a lot of these events, we don't really have a hard time filling this thing. No. Like today was, you're not going to fill every single one. No, but. it's still, and even the Smithsonian, even well established, you know, they might get people to RSVP in 20, to oh, yeah. or 20, you know, because there's a lot of competition and it's free. Yep. So a lot of people are RSVP, and if they can't make it, they haven't paid for it. Paid for it, Right, they haven't yeah. paid it. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's for free. Was it you like about the event? No, no, not today. But I mean, yeah. So, but you're apparently jealous of us. You're not. Right. Yeah, no, I have. I've done this quite a quite a bit, and I like our where we were before, or where I was before my previous job, um, is where I like actually learned all this stuff and and honed their setup and. Um, like there, I uh, we did a full build out of of the event space, planning for you know doing recordings and and uh, all that sort of stuff. We didn't really live stream so much. I mean, it was similar in the sense that we didn't live stream to YouTube, um, but we would allow people to dial in if they wanted so. Okay. So we would like, it would be similar to, we would start a, um, um, uh, a Teams video conferencing session. Oh, okay. And a lot of them were just kind of invite only within the Libertarian network, because they're okay. kind of, they're a little weird about that, but. Yeah, no, you're right about, I mean, you have a lot of good points, but they Yeah. In a sense, the sense of it too is a lot don't like authority at all, and or anything that's organized, yeah. then they carry it into their personal lives. It's, there's a kind of an anarchistic an anarchy. Oh yeah, there's a there's a you there's have. Um, I mean, as with any any sort of uh, any group, you have a big spread of mm -hmm. different. So you do have the anarchists who basically think the world should burn. Um, and then you have the, the people that just kind of think that government doesn't belong in, you know, right. in everybody's affairs. So, right. so like, you kind of, you have that spread. And it, and it's, it was really interesting working yeah. there, having yeah. the thing. Cato Institute is the Have you heard of them? Yeah. C-A-T-O. Yep, uh-huh. Yeah, we used to work with them. Um, there are a few that are actually in BC, and they're not really part of what you call it the network, but yeah, it's all a little weird. All out in Arlington, there's a whole bunch of them. Oh, are there? I live in Arlington. Yeah, um, like all up and down Washington Boulevard. So, yeah. Really? I didn't realize that. Yeah, I mean, you would never know. They're just in office buildings. And, and they're small, like... They're, mm -hmm. they're all pretty small. They're, they recently, a friend of mine works for one of the bigger ones, the other bigger ones, and they're actually... Wow. 
consolidating a lot of those um, into one larger organization. It's just, I mean, they're all kind of doing the same thing separately in different organizations. It didn't really make any sense just because they had kind of grown up over the years. So. Mm -hmm. That's pretty interesting to think that this whole weird world exists out there. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool. I mean, I it's I like a lot of their ideas. Their um, at least the the organization the organization I work for they were much more. Well, one side was much more focused on economics and stuff. Right. Um, and that's pretty well proven that you shouldn't have government meddling around in, in your economy too much. Too much. The more, the more they tax, the more they regulate the mm -hmm. It's Like, for example, the last time, this may be the case for the market side, well, by conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, the last time we did rare earth elements, they used to make. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We think that you know, Russia, China, they have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. so the last time we did a survey in the United States was the 70s. Really? Uh, and Trump had one of the interior department do a survey mm -hmm. in the U.S., I mean, the geological, geophysical survey, to look for um, rare earth elements. Mm -hmm. It may be that we don't have a shortage. It may be that. We just stopped the government a long time ago, mm -hmm. regulated, mm -hmm. and, and you can't yeah. do it. And then these certain corporations stepped in and got overseas with people. Mm -hmm. and so we made, you know, it's like shortage of oil and gas. There's no shortage of oil and gas. Well, the, the, that that at least is because of the advent of uh, shale processing. Shale and tar sands and horizontal drilling and fracking. And yeah. But anyway, so there's a lot of things that, yeah, or, but yeah, generally all the regulation taxation. Yeah. I mean, I think there are certain areas that you have to have the one, that you have to have it, ones where there's no, there's a major societal benefit, but there's no benefit to people. So like the environment. But you can't just dump chemicals and right like there there's a clear benefit to companies to pollute the environment and a clear benefit to society for us to have a right. clean environment and right. then if you don't regulate those industries then you know they're gonna um, Yeah, I think it...